with fear creeping into the markets as we enter into this uncharted territory, global central bankers are facing their biggest challenge yet. The Fed just cut rates by a whopping 50 basis points, a level previously only used during a crisis. But it was supposed to instill confidence. Ooh, the central banks have our back. And it seemed to actually do, oh, I don't know, the opposite. So the big question is, is it working? Did it work? And how do gold and silver fit into this picture? And then finally, what's next? All that and a lot more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive. And for those that have been watching this for a while, and if they've gotten prepared, if you've gotten prepared and you've gotten your food, your water, your energy, your security, your barterability, your wealth preservation, your community and your shelter, I'm pretty sure right now you're very glad that you did, considering that I'm hearing about um, shortages on the grocery store shelves. But I have to tell you, this is going to be kind of an unusual one because I told you what I would do is show you what the central banks are doing about the coronavirus outbreak. So we're gonna start with uh, where we're at but this is going to be a bit longer. So I'm gonna try and go through some of these slides faster. The truth is, is I kind of feel like I, I'm playing volleyball with a lot of balls coming at me all at once. So forgive me if this is a little disjointed because I promise you I am pedaling just as quickly as I can. So in the US, they're saying that the cases are going to rise and the first death, the first death occurred earlier than we thought. So as more testing is coming online and on board, then I'm sure we're going to see a lot more cases coming on board. I will tell you that for me personally, the biggest key to this is making sure that my immune system is well boosted. I do that with my health through, I mean, there are lots of different ways to do it, but I do it with very, very clean eating, lots of greens, and lots of vitamin C's, vitamin D's, things that will boost your immune system and also create an alkalinized system so that disease can't live there. Or at least if it does, it's not going to be that great. But I also do it with my wealth in the form of physical gold and silver, which is a savings-based system in the face of everything else. However, Back to the coronavirus, now over 94,000 global cases in 82 countries. When I first pulled this up, there were 33 countries. So this is spreading really like wildfire. And in Italy, they just closed all the schools and universities for two weeks. This has huge implications for the global economy because if people aren't doing their normal day-to-day -day activities, well, they're not stopping at restaurants or they're not stopping to get gas, they're not going on trips, et cetera, et cetera. So the central banks to the rescue. First on Monday, you had the OECD come out and, and follow these links. There's gonna be a lot of slides, but you have access to all of these on the blogs and to read and look at the entire OECD uh, piece. The, what they're talking about, it's below. They're saying the world economy is at risk. So the question is, can central banks save us? All right, so they say that the world economy now faces its greatest danger since 2008. Actually, I would personally say it is a much bigger danger because back in 2008, interest rates were a lot higher and central bank balance sheets were a lot lower. Now you've got most of the world anchored at zero or near zero or below zero. And debt is what 
the central bankers use and bankers use to stimulate the economies. And all that stimulus didn't really work. So the coronavirus, this pandemic, disrupted people's lives. Yes, obviously. And that activity has slowed dramatically because of containment measures. In other words, trying to keep it under control, whether it's closing the schools, as we just saw that Italy did, and we'll see more and more of that, or people being sick and not being able to leave their house. Or if they're really living from paycheck to paycheck, since the gestation period is somewhere between 14 and 28 days, you know, if you are like an Uber driver or you're working in the service industry, you might be juggling two or three different jobs just to make ends meet. And if you don't work, you don't get paid. And they know that. So they're, I'm going to show you what they're talking about to address it. But it has negative spillover throughout the entire global economy, not just in tourism and supply chains, but also key is this confidence piece. Because remember, central bankers, those that rule us, rule so because they have our confidence. And I've been showing you how that's been diminishing over the years, but this could tip it into uh, them losing control like we're seeing in Iran because of how poorly they handled this. But hey, there, were, there was a revolution going on or there was a lot, well, maybe not a revolution, but there was a lot of unhappiness in the public to the, to the elites in Iran before this, just like there is globally. That's why we have the move toward nationalism and deglobalization. This is speeding that shift up. Right? That's the reset. This will justify it. And if it's because of an illness, then it's not because of our policies, then just maybe they can stay in power. But I really hope that's not the case. So what they're going to do is ensure liquidity buffers for affected industries worldwide. So how does the coronavirus impact it? And this is all from that OECD uh, study. Well, Containment measures are things like quarantines, travel bans and restrictions, closures of public places, the supply channel. So this is how it flows uh, and has a global impact. Factory closures, workers aren't there or there's too many sick. Cut back in service provisions and supply chain disruptions. So the shelves go bare, but because China is still basically shut down, I think the most current thing I heard was their factories are 40% operational. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But since the world is depending upon China as the manufacturer, when those short store shelves go bare, you might just not get that product back, even if there were shoppers for it. On the demand side, they're talking about loss of confidence. Look at these stock markets. Down a thousand points, up a thousand points. Interest rates, 10-year yields below 1%. That is showing a loss of confidence and that is critical that it be maintained or this is game over. I mean, the dollar has basically no purchasing power left. It's only because people can't conceive that they would not have a dollar. But hey, it's lost over 97% of its value since the central bank took over. Business and tourism travel, where you're looking at conventions that are not taking place in physical form. Virtual, sure. But physical, no, that money is gone. It's not coming back into the system. And education and entertainment services. So things like movie theaters or any place where groups meet. Well, you know, I mean, ask yourself, how comfortable are you going to be feeling going to a large gathering of people? You're probably not going to be really comfortable. And as, as I've said, you know, I had a trip to just a little weekend getaway to New Orleans. I'm not going. So, you know, that tells you and I'm not the only one. The airlines, the hotels, et cetera, restaurants, this is a big problem for them. They also point out how interconnected 
the supply chain is. So this blue area, this is China in the center, and the blue area is around computers, electronics, and electrical equipment. The green area is about transport, transport equipment, uh, the transport equipment sector. So, you know, if China is shut down, they're not getting what they need in those areas, and that creates problems. But again, what we are most likely to be seeing because of the lack of demand are a lot of companies that were marginal at best as far as staying uh, a viable business that will most likely start to default soon. Because as I showed you uh, last week, in China, it was something like 84% of the corporations only have enough cash to get them through for three months. And the clock is ticking. And I think it was uh, something like 34% for one month. And we're, we just passed that one month. So they have to be supported. But a rising corporate bond default is going to make people nervous. What's been happening, as I showed you yesterday, is as the yields have gone down, even though there have been a lot more defaults, as the yields have gone down, the principal value on the bonds that have not defaulted have risen. So if you own them in something like an ETF or a mutual fund, that principal, that increase, can mask the defaults. But if enough of it happens with enough entities, which is where we are right now, we're likely to see a rise in defaults. Well, there you're going to have loss of confidence and people wanting to get out of those instruments. Also going to that volatility. I mean, you know, I mean, everybody loves it when it goes up, but boy, I'm listening to CNBC when I'm getting ready in the morning and they don't even trust any of these rallies. They think there's more to be uh, more danger ahead. So, you know, if you've got the talking heads whose job is to get you in these markets and keep you in these markets, basically telling you, well, okay, you can leave money in there. Or maybe you can nibble a little bit, but, but really you got to wait for the next shoe to drop. That should tell you that the foundation has eroded to a point. I mean, this very well could be the final Jenga piece. I'm not sure that it is. Time is going to tell us that. But I don't know how we come back from this because it seems to be getting worse, not better. I'm sure at some point it'll get better, but I don't think that that's yet. So we look at the policy tools that the OECD is saying that the global central bankers and governments have. So we're going to put new money, which means, means uh, more debt, because we're going to have to create this into the hospitals and the health sector and setting up temporary cash transfers to vulnerable households, which I'll show you in a minute. But that is your helicopter money. So they are talking about, look, you know, if you are dependent on a service, if you're a service provider and you're driving Ubers and you can't work, well, then you'd still need that income. So if they give the income to people that will spend it like they did in 2008 for the cash for clunkers or that $600 um, tax rebate for the lowest earners, the most vulnerable parts, well, yeah, they go out and spend it. But it does not do anything to um, generate ongoing income. It's like a one-shot deal. So this could very well be their excuse to, in, to uh, bring in universal income, which as you know, we've been talking about it for a long time. Now, this is where really, it, for me, it gets a lot more interesting when they're talking about what the policy can do for firms and then for uh, banks. So they can reduce or delay tax payments for most affected sectors. So not for you or me, that wasn't in that area, right? But they're going to make sure that we're, maybe we get a universal income, but they're not going to reduce or delay any tax payments. Uh, although the government in this country, the U.S. government is talking about uh, some tax uh, to reduce the taxes and some other benefits. So we'll see because consumers have to have money to spend or they can't consume. 
expand liquidity and, and availability of credit to firms. So in other words, even though you have this mountain of debt, particularly that you've accumulated since 2008 in this zero interest rate environment, take on more debt. We're going to make it available for you. We're going to lower our standards and our criteria to make sure that you can take on, or corporations can take on more debt. Okay, fixing a too much debt problem with more debt makes a whole lot of sense to me. Not. Also, reduce public sector arrears to firms. So in other words, if you're a corporation and you sell something to uh, a state or federal or local government uh, right now, and anybody can share their experience if they have this out there, but right now, you know, you've got to wait maybe 30, 60, 90 days before you get paid. So to put this on to the states more, they're saying, okay, well, maybe we can pay that faster. Well, yeah, that might help corporations, companies, especially smaller ones uh, and medium-sized ones. But at the macro level, they can expand liquidity to banks. Oh, you mean like they've been doing in the repo markets and that's $60 billion a month? Yeah, we can do more of that. Sure, of course they can, because it takes nothing to create it. Ensure monetary policy response to extreme market conditions. Well, I'd say these market conditions, with the movement in them being up and down a thousand points thanks to the algorithms, I'd say these are pretty extreme. So what I'm hearing when I'm seeing that is probably something along the order of Japan, who is basically buying the stock market and buying the bond market. Why the heck not? And then finally, let automatic stabilizers fully work and boost public investment. So what they're really talking about in here is, um, you know how they were running off their balance sheet? Allow that to happen so that you can reinvest that. But mostly what they're talking about and all that gobbledygook is more debt to solve a debt problem. It may postpone it like we've seen since 2008, but like we're seeing today, it doesn't fix it. And the structural damage is great. And what's been happening in the stock markets technically, I mean, we are now testing the new experiment that kicked the ETFs and the algorithms that kicked in in 2008. But that loss of confidence is the key for the elites, for those that are in charge. So for the central banks, for the governments. Okay, that's the OECD. The very, that same day, there was a joint statement between the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, 189 countries of the world, Treasury Secretaries, Central Bank Chiefs, and the World Bank. And we're going to use all of our available instruments to the fullest extent possible. You know what? I pulled a book out. Here it is. Sorry, I didn't want to... Uh, to uh, forget about this because this is important. But what they're saying is we're going to extend credit. We're going to extend credit, more debt, more credit. It's all they have, people. It's all they have. They cannot make you go out and shop if you're sick or if you're nervous about getting sick. So the IMF says, okay, how can they help the countries? emergency financing and really they're going to work very quickly on putting you and the countries in greater debt look at greece and all of the austerity that the imf put them through but this is really key in here because the imf is showing up as the global lender of last resort catastrophe containment and relief trust more debt more money Augmentation under existing programs, again, they can rapidly augment existing programs, so more debt, more, it, it, it's just, it's, it's the same thing. I can go through all of it. It's all the same. More debt, and therefore, on the other side of this, you are a whole lot more dependent upon them. And I know that we were talking about uh, cashless money. The IMF issues the SDR. 
That stands for special drawing rights, but it is just a name like the dollar is just a, ma just a name. And unlike the dollar, the US dollar, or any of the individual countries that have to, at least at this point, uh, take on more debt or grow more debt in order to create the money, the IMF's SDR is a basket. Now, I cannot guarantee this, but I've been watching this evolve since 2009 when China said as a new world reserve currency, what about the SDR? And since that's been around since 69, created to take over for the dollar in the 70s when we were losing control again. It's not quite like now, but yeah, it's like now. It was put to bed, but it was never dissolved. So it was tested in 2009, and the IMF controls it. So this would make a very logical transition into the new money. And my bet is globally it's going to be the SDR. I'm going to be right or I'm going to be wrong. I really can't say. But the G7 met yesterday. Now, who's the G7? the United States, Japan, Canada, the UK, France, Italy, and Germany. That's who makes up the G7. And they came out with a joint statement, which the markets didn't like very much, apparently, that although, because they didn't feel like they gave anything concrete, they just said that they will continue to fulfill their mandates and maintain the resilience of the financial system. Well, let me tell you, Take a look at what's been happening. Does that look particularly resilient to you? Why in the world is the Federal Reserve injecting 60 billion a month into buying short-term treasuries, as well as the billions and billions, hundreds of billions and trillions that they're putting into the repo market? Because the system isn't resilient unless they create new money and to put into the system because not so resilient. So in my opinion, it's, it's garbage, but they came out to show a coordinated uh, and a cooperative effort to solving this problem, or at least throwing more money out of it. And they are ready to cooperate even further. Oh, good. Don't you feel comfortable now? How's your confidence level? Because frankly, if anybody has read the book, Where the Wild Things Are, let the wild rumpus start. Now, it started before those meetings in, uh, on February 25th, China was already at action stimulating or pushing new money into the system through SMEs or small to medium enterprises. So they're going to give them debt and they're going to cut the taxes from 3% to 1% and they're going to job support for graduates. I don't even really know what that one means and agricultural workers, but here's the point in this. It takes more money to run all of these programs. So you can, you can pretty much rest assured that even though they're going to cut taxes for the moment, and, and they're talking about that here as well, that those taxes for the individuals will most likely pile on higher on the other side of this mess because all this means is that countries are running greater deficits. And a deficit is when they keep spending more than they are taking in. In this country, we're already running at a trillion dollars. Last time we did that was in the crisis and it's gonna get worse. And that was even before the coronavirus, before anybody was even thinking about the coronavirus. So China stepped up to the plate and the ECB, well, they're, they stand ready to adjust all instruments as appropriate. And they went back to their QE ways where they're buying uh, corporate bonds as well as the government bonds. And the Bank of Japan will strive to provide ample liquidity. Well, look, at they already own most of the stock market and most of the bond market. So what are they going to do? Own the rest of it? I mean, it, it's really kind of a joke. And the Federal Reserve, we will use our tools and act as appropriate to support the economy. And what did he do? Well, I'll tell you that in just a second. 
because the very first mover was actually Australia and they dropped rates. And then let's see, Malaysia and they dropped rates. And then the US and they dropped rates. You see people, they, they only have this one tool and they're already anchored at zero. So it doesn't have the kind of impact to inspire people to go out and spend. But what it might do, because it did it in 2008, right? Think about this. Why did they drop rates then? Because they wanted to support the stock market. And if you as an investor are generating income based upon your savings in these markets, when interest rates are lower, well, you go out on the risk spectrum. And that's what's been happening since 2008. So it isn't even that people are in a safe place and then they need to go or then they're pushed out on the risk spectrum. They're already there. So now you're taking on more and more risk like the pension plans that now invest in completely illiquid assets. And hey, anybody that's been part of Robinhood, that's what lack of liquidity looks like. You have no access. There's nothing you can do on one way or the other. That was a computer glitch. It lasted a couple of days. I don't know where it's at today, but it's a great example of when you lose all choice. I'm not talking about that today because there's too many other things. But what I will show you is that the last times that the Fed has done this emergency rate cut was in 2008. But it's a good thing. The economy is really, really, really strong. Now, what we initially got it was kind of interesting because I watched this whole thing unfold. Initially, you saw this surge in the stock market, I think it was down like maybe 235 points. And then before you know, I mean, seriously, in the blink of an eye, it was up 235 points. It ended up closing down, I think, 785 for the day. Not good. Not good, technically, because that tells you how much damage has already been done. However, the global markets, look at when these central banks create money, it has to go someplace. So where does it go? Well, most likely into the stock market, into the real estate market, into the bond market, even at the same time that it is destroying what itty bitty bit of purchasing power it still has left. Did all of that money printing save anything? No, it did not, but it did buy time to transfer risk which is something that I've shown you over these years, those who have been watching, you know, it transfer risk from the few, from the elites to the many. Good thing we have those institutional investors that invest your money when you make that deposit into your 401k or you buy a mutual fund or an ETF. Because at the end of the day, you're the one that's gonna eat it, not them. So here, when they did that, what happened? Okay, well, this is a timeline. So 10-year treasuries went from about 1.1%, which was abysmal to begin with, below 1%. It did close just barely above it, but every single time I look today, it's below it. So what does that tell you? Does that tell you that there's confidence there? No. Is that a good thing? No. This is going to hurt bank profits, which we already know they're doing a lot, especially the commercial banks are trading a lot. So the volatility is good for them. It'll be interesting to see. I'm going to, in fact, um, would you mark down uh, to on my calendar? I'm going to check the OCC's uh, derivative trading in the FDIC insured banks after this quarter that we're in right now. It, it'll be interesting to see what those profits look like, at least according to the OECD. But that was yesterday. This is today. And every time I've checked, and I've been watching this like all day, so I can't absolutely guarantee that this is true because obviously I'm not watching it right now when I'm talking to you, but every single time I checked, the 10-year note yield was below 1%, below 1%. 
That means that instead of instilling confidence, fear is gripping these markets. I don't know. If you listen to the talking heads, they'll tell you to stay, but you have to decide what you are most comfortable with. Now, I haven't shown you guys this for a while, so bear with me on this because this is really important. Okay, and mm, it's not giving me my laser pointer. What we're looking at here, there it is. Okay, this is the VIX or the volatility index on the 10-year treasury. Now, some of you that have been watching this for a while have seen me do uh, other pieces on this where back in 2007, actually when they started tracking, it was I think 2003, that it was a straight line because there just wasn't a whole lot of volatility in the treasury market. Nor should there be if that's the foundation to the global markets. But in 2008, that changed. So what was a dash, and I hope you can see it, and if you can't go in, you, you can pull it up at stock charts and you can look for yourself or you can pull it up in our blog. But what went from a dash then went to a line, okay? But kind of a, you can see it, still in a narrow range until we hit 2013. And a lot of things shifted in 2013. But this is when the markets were handed over to traders. And I know they, and they were talking about that a lot this morning. Don't fight the Fed. Actually, don't fight the markets because the markets are dictating what the Fed is going to do. And if this drop in interest rates didn't prove that, Think again, we'll see more of it. The markets don't like it. They have a temper tantrum. The traders are in charge. The central bankers aren't in charge. The traders are in charge. The central bankers will just give them more free money morphine, but the traders are in charge. Look at this, right? I, I think it's pretty easy to see that transition. I don't care what anybody says, there it is. Now, I want to take it down because there's another pattern shift that I'm noticing and I think it's a key one. So I'm going to show it to you. So this is just a year. This is a year. So this one goes back to 2006. This is a year. And you can see where there have been the spikes through the repo market and all of that. But look at how much more, uh, how do I say this, more full right? So you're not just getting this thin line spike up on a day to day basis, but this spike is consolidating and it's getting thicker, which means more traders in this market. So this bears watching, but I think it's an indication of the markets breaking down. I'm not saying that they can't make it look like it's going up. Remember, all that free money that they're going to print. And also, remember, we talked about the gaps when the markets gap down. I mean, technically, I would expect it to go and fill those gaps, especially when you're being flooded with a whole bunch of free money. Time will tell. So now, getting a little bit more specific, every adult in Hong Kong gets cash handout, right? And that's that one-time thing. But they're also, and I think the reason why I brought this up particularly is because this could be a blueprint of what we could expect if this outbreak gets worse and if the economy in the U.S. gets worse. Uh, relief measures for businesses, so low interest loans with 100% guaranteed by the government and a profit tax reduction of 100% on a certain limit. Okay, they're going to guarantee loans and they're going to and you don't have to pay taxes on your profits. Waiving business registration fees, so waiving fees, uh, extending subsidies on electricity, water and sewage. So th does this not kind of seem like like helicopter money to you? Except that I am not seeing in here where they're saying they're going to do it on a, on a month to month basis yet. Yet. 
for citizens measures including salaries tax reduction of 100% on the first 20,000 Hong Kong dollars, waiving rates on property to a ceiling of 1,500 Hong Kong dollars per quarter, one month's rent for lower income tenants, and the list goes on and on. I, I'm, I wanna make this short, cause I still, I know, usually I don't do this many slides, but I'm telling you, the data is just coming so fast right now. So it sounds like a lot if somebody gets this windfall. And there was some cash for clunkers, but it made a teeny weeny blip. It did not do an ongoing stimulation because apparently what the government does not understand is that there is self-liquidating debt, which would be the kind of debt that they could utilize to actually grow the economy or non-self-liquidating debt where you give it to them once, they go out and spend it and that's it. So everything that the government does unfortunately appears to be non-self-liquidating debt. I, I could certainly be wrong about that. Um, although not in any of the debt areas that I look at, I'm not wrong about it. And I wanted to show you what happened to those markets on that day, because look, that big, huge spike up, and that's not enough. So President Trump wants us to go negative. Do I think we're gonna go negative? Yes, I do. Do I think that's a good thing? No, I don't. And Europe doesn't think it's a good thing, and they've been negative since 2009. So they get the impact of that. I think that the president is more thinking about it as a developer, where sure, you want the lowest rates possible if you've got to borrow money, and hey, if you don't have to pay back as much as you borrow, that's even better. But it absolutely kills the banking system, which is the mechanism to transmit the, the policies of the central banks to the economy and the system was already weak. So this is like a knockout blow when the system was already on its knees. And that below 1% on the 10 year, that is not a good thing. And if you see negative rates in here, just like why didn't that make you confident that, wow, the central bankers have your back? Because the central bankers don't have your back. That's why. Are you confident in them? I'm definitely not. And so I. this is from today, and you can see here's zero, not happening. And here's the 30 years, 1.626 to loan money to the government for 30 years. Does that even make any sense on any planet? 10-year note at 1%, five-year note below that, two-year note below that. I mean, come on. You know, how hard do you work for your money? I know how hard I work for it. Would I loan it to somebody for that? Only if they're my children. <laughs> Only if they're my children. Now, I've had a lot of questions about gold mining stocks versus spot gold. Both of them are severely undervalued. But this is GDX, which is a gold miners ETF. And the point that I wanna show you is how much more volatile this is than even the spot market. Why? Because gold miner stocks are stocks. They don't really represent the underlying gold that might or might not be in the mine. So it's two different birds. You want to make sure that we're not going to see a lot more nationalization, but you certainly need to check on that because that's been a problem for the gold miners since um, I'm pretty sure 2010. I could be off a little bit, but Ernst & Young does a report on that annually. Having said all of that, what are central banks buying? Now, if they're buying stocks, it's to prop up the market. It's not in form of reserves. They are buying the physical gold. And here is the full year for 2019. And interesting, when did they start buying, right? Now, it went positive in 2010, but you can see already in 2007, and particularly in 2008, that they stopped selling off their gold. So 
the central banks have been accumulating since the crisis. Me too. Actually, since even before the 2008 crisis. Me too. That's what I've been doing. When do you want to get ready? You want to get ready when it's too late? No. So I'm hoping that right along you have taken my advice. If not, look, the truth of the matter is, is I do think they're going to come up with an antidote and, you know, and they'll get this thing under control. But the underlying damage to the economy and to businesses is already done. It's already done. That's why you're seeing everybody panic, all the central banks panic, and the World Bank, and the IMF, and the OECD, and, you know, all BIS, and all the powers that be, because they know that the damage is already done. Can they stay in power through the system reset? And by the way, I am very sorry if I never really explained to you what a reset of a system is, but when central banks and governments are completely out of tools and there is no value left in the currency and the financial system no longer functions properly, which all these big swings should show you that if nothing else does, then they have to go into a new system. That's what a reset is. And I had somebody, um, actually I did an interview with Sean this morning and he was kind of upset about the price of silver. Here's the whole piece about that. Who cares, honestly, who cares what it is in terms of fiat? It could go to a trillion fiat dollars. But if it goes and when it goes to a trillion fiat dollars, you are not going to want to convert your gold or silver into that fiat money because nobody will take it. You're not even going to want to work for it. You're not going to be able to buy any toilet paper with it. But gold and silver are real money and they have uses across the entire economic spectrum. So what do you do? You take advantage of it just like the central banks are. You take advantage of it. There are always opportunities. You just need to know what those look like and how to determine that. And it's not rocket science. If you don't want to get technical at all, all you have to do is look at what the smartest guys in the room on any given topic are doing for themselves. And the central banks are buying gold. Why? because they want to remain in power and they'll have purchasing power at the end of this if they've got gold and so will you. So I've gone on for like a really uh, long time, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple of, I'll, I'll do a question anyway. Um, let's see, I am desperately wanting to buy a house. Would now be a good time or should I stay put for a while? Well, PT, here's what I'm thinking. Okay, number one, you have to have shelter. And if you already have a house, you would be trading one overvalued asset for another overvalued asset. So if this one would work better for you, why not? Now, we are most likely going to, we shouldn't, but we are most likely going to take a playbook out of um, Denmark where they've got negative yields on mortgages. Will that drive more people to, bra to buy houses and inflate those houses even more? Probably, probably. But what I can also tell you is I am more convinced today than I have ever, ever been in my life that this is going to look very much like Japan in the early 90s. In that case, residential real estate dropped 85%. Commercial dropped ninety five percent, so I I I I I can't really answer that for you because you have to do what you are comfortable with. But hey, you know Megan just did because she was busting at the seams where she was, so she didn't really have a choice. But she just traded one overvalued house that didn't work for her family 
for another overvalued house that works better for her family. And having said that, as part of the strategy, it is to pay off those loans during the reset when gold moves to its fundamental value. So if you have a strategy in place, then it's a hard one to answer. It's really a hard one to answer because it's such a, it's, it's such a personal thing and you've got to have a roof over your head. So I'm going to leave that up to you, but you might want to call and talk about the strategy, which does involve using gold and silver to maintain your property taxes and to pay off your mortgage. So uh, yesterday I had a conversation with George Gammon, who is absolutely brilliant and a whole lot of fun. Uh, and we had a lot to talk about with this. I think you're going to enjoy that interview. I'm anticipating it, posting it tomorrow. So it'll be a couple days old, but still amazing information in there. And this morning, this is why I'm late, uh, Sean over at SGT interviewed me. Also, a great, great conversation. Uh, check back to see when we're going to post it, but he said he most likely will happen tomorrow. Next week, I'm going to be doing a podcast with Be Unconstrained, and I will be unconstrained, I promise you. And if you have any questions, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. Make sure to visit our blog where you can find all of the links. And I would go in and I would read all that stuff, especially the uh, report and the slide share from uh, the OECD because there was a ton of fabulous material there. So if you need us, we're here. We're just a phone call away, 888-696-4653. And we've been busy, but we're going to make sure to, to help you because we are all here to be of service. And I know that there have been people here starting at 6 o'clock at night, and the morning rather, and staying until 7 o'clock at night. Whew. So with, without further ado, we're going to end it here and keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and physical silver. And until next we meet, please, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.